about uh, Kiwanis International. I'd appreciate it. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting us uh, earlier this week. And enjoyed ourselves, and uh, I have told numerous people about Phil the puffer fish. So, um, <laughs> yeah, if, for those I, of you I, don't, I that, that don't know, Eric has a, a puffer fish that acts like a pet dog. Um, so, literally, likes to be pet and and fed shrimp. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, you are, you are all uh, part of a, you know, global organization. Um, you know, we're in 80, uh, 80 some countries and, um, and uh, you know, really the sun never sets on, uh, you know, Kiwana service uh, around the world. And, uh, you know, our little corner in Indianapolis, I mean, you know, Eric and I were talking about just the sheer um, number of lives that have been affected by, uh, you know, members of our club and support of our, of our club over a um, hundred years. Um, it's it's really uh, heartening uh, the number of things that and the stories, you know, that I get on uh, you know a weekly basis from you know clubs around uh, around the world. The story I was telling, um, we were talking about uh, India, um, and. Uh, I was uh, visiting with our club there in New Delhi, um, and they said, "You know, you sh we'd like you to go to Hyderabad and uh, you know talk to them about uh, you know how Kiwanis can help down there." So we met with the uh, State Department uh, down there, and uh, you know we said, "How can Kiwanis make a difference?" Um, for uh, you know the community in India and. And I was telling Eric that uh, they said, uh, you know, build toilets. It's not sexy, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, young ladies who are, you know, basically second class citizens still in that country, uh, they go to school and, um, you know, they begin to reach puberty and uh, they don't have facilities within their, um, their school. And so they have to just go out in the field and, and do their business. And uh, if they have the facilities there to, um, you know, go to the restroom, um, they're more apt to stay in school. And if they're if they stay in school and uh, you know get real world skills, that not only lifts up them and their opportunities, but it lifts up generations and families. Um, for, well, like I said, for, for generations um, and all that just because, you know, somebody invested in building a, a toilet um, for, a, you know, a young girl uh, or young girls in India. So I know it's not sexy, but uh, it's just little things like that that Kiwanis are doing, uh, you know, around the world that um, affects the lives of, uh, of people on a daily basis and uh, you should be proud uh, this club has a long 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 history of not only um, supporting uh, needs in Indianapolis but looking at the larger scope of the needs around the world no I appreciate that very much yeah like you you stated Jeff it's not always the the, the, the shiniest fundraisers but anything can be material when you look globally, and I, I, I was uh, touched as uh, you and Jenny Lamita and I were walking through some of those global points. So if you ever need a, a lunch date in Paris, uh, let, let, let me know for your, for your next visit there. So um, I'd like to thank Trent Cowles as our October lunch speaker. Um, I see uh, Trina has started uh, screen sharing. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to thank everybody who could join us this past Friday at South Grove Golf Course for our picnic and golf outing. We had about 30 participants. So that will be a uh, new format for the golf outing mo moving forward where we'll try to tie that in a little bit more inclusively for people who aren't necessarily golfers, but still want a, a good excuse to hang out and, and, and socialize. The, the, the food was good. I can thank uh, Tina and her husband 
for uh, following the instructions of taking well over a uh, hundred photographs that day. And there, there, there were some good ones. So they were in the, the weekly newsletter. And again, if anybody likes any of the specific shots, then I'll get those uh, printed off and, and, and mailed out. Um, all in-person club meetings have been shifted to virtual through 2020. Our board will continue to meet and keep the discussion going and we'll keep the communications coming with <laughs> updates. So next week, we've got Greg Dye from Duke University Lemur Center speaking. So given the, the, the you already know my dirty secret of having a, a puffer fish. So uh, lemurs are the most endangered mammals on earth, uh, indigenous only to Madagascar. So that should be a fun speaker next week. We have surpassed our Kiwanis legacy campaign goal of $105,000. So thanks to everybody who contributed. Thanks to Gelzer for their very impactful $5,000 gift at the 11th hour that really did help garner attention. So thanks to the, the team at Gelzer. And if anybody is still looking to contribute, the, the foundation is always very appreciative. It, you might consider giving to our club in lieu of paying for lunch. Any amount would be appreciated. And th those links are also in the, the weekly newsletter through uh, PayPal. We've got a lot of guests today. So I'm gonna leave the guest introductions closer to the end of the call. So we would love to hear where everybody is joining us from and just to give our speaker the time that she deserves. We'll save the, the guest acknowledgements for the end. But the, 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 the reach of our meetings has expanded exponentially and we, we appreciate everybody who's joining us from outside of Indianapolis. So, but before we turn it over to Mrs. Lynn, who I am thrilled to hear speak, I've got the state.gov website open. So I've got a list of about 18 different topics for you to touch on, Lynn, when you're done with, with your presentation. So we can talk about energy or ocean and polar affairs, 5G security, et cetera, as broad as the, the reach of your organization is, it's inspiring. So I, I would like to turn it over to Miss Lauren Holloway, who is one of the club sponsors and advisors for the Perry Meridian High School Key Club. And as we look at the, the coming weeks going into the holidays, I'll ask the Action Club, Builders Club sponsors each week to give us a little update of the good work we're doing. And again, uh, Laura, the, the new member goal of the, the person who brings in the most members from October to September 21 in their Samsung 65 inch TV courtesy of uh, Mike Halstead and the new membership committee that applies to the, the key clubbers and builders clubbers and circle payers who are able to recruit any parents, neighbors, co-students, parents, neighbors. So uh, no, please, uh, Lauren, if you could please give us an update on the, uh, the service leadership program you're involved with. Sure, I would be happy to. Um, and I, I see Lou Drexler is on the call too. So if I missed anything, Lou, uh, feel free to chime in here. So I know uh, Perry Meridian Key Club has been very busy. Um, they have adapted to the current situation really well. Uh, they did start the school year earlier, um, you know, probably at the beginning of August, uh, and they've already gotten uh, their membership uh, goal met uh, with 100 members. And they've also found ways to engage members by using some online, le le learning how to engage members online. Uh, because some of the students there are all online and some of them are coming in uh, to the building part-time. So that's been an interesting learning situation for them, but they're enjoying it. Um, they've also held elections for 
directors. They have um, help added uh, new directors and um, done a, a great way of just trying to reach out to the each class um, at Perry Meridian. Um, another piece that they have uh, we're currently working on is just updating our, our roster and getting dues, <coughs> money turned in. Um, but besides all the business aspect of Key Club, they have been doing some fun things with uh, planning fun things with um, Riley uh, Children's Hospital, uh, trying to do some uh, uh, trunk or treat situation instead of a Riley Dance Marathon um, here for October. Um, also working with the Indianapolis Zoo, um, they need volunteers and that's one of their favorite activities to go volunteer at the zoo. So they're happy that the that's an opportunity for them. Um, they are also, uh, we got a trick or treat for UNICEF, as you guys can see on my, uh, on my background, that's a, um, a link. If you take a picture of it with your phone, uh, uh, it links us, uh, links you to a donation page. I can also put that in the chat if you guys are interested um, in uh, donating to the Perry Meridian High School Key Club uh, virtual trick or treat box. It's um, where the students actually get a chance to go online and do some fun activities and unlock the funds. Um, and then they get to decide how it uh, goes uh, towards the Eliminate project, uh, eliminating neonatal tetanus um, uh, around the world. So that's an exciting piece too that they're about to be working on. That's open until November 15th, so that's good. Um, Another really big uh, piece of news, last piece of news here is the, um, the first time that I have been involved, they're trying to do a uh, Youth Opportunities Fund application to get a grant. Um, they would like to um, have a backpack weekend meal uh, program working with the local Freedom's Church. Um, they have that already set up. They've been doing donations for those. They would just like to apply for the grant this year. So that's an exciting piece for uh, the Key Club. Oh, thank you very much, Laura. Thanks for your help. Thanks for Lou's help. And, and that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Trina Rauderbush to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. Uh, I am super excited uh, that Lynn was able to join us today and very blown away by her bio uh, that I'd like to read to you. Uh, Lynn Sykade is the Office Director of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor's Office of Multilateral and Governmental Affairs. Now we understand why our government has acronyms. Uh, the Bureau handles an array of human rights and democracy policy issues with respect to the United Nations, internet freedom and technology, business and human rights, marginalized populations, civil society, good governance, and visa issuance. She began her career in the US Department of State in 1990. She has served in El Salvador, the United Kingdom, Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, and the East Asia and Pacific Bureau. She joined DRL in 2001. She's an expert on human rights uh, and the United Nations. She has represented the US in the UN where she negotiated and delivered positions uh, on behalf of the United States. She has authored several UN resolutions, most notably the resolution that created a special repertoire on freedom of association and peaceful assembly. Uh, she has received numerous superior and meritorious honor awards uh, for her work. Prior to joining DRL, she served, on, as, she served as a special assistant to the US representative of guarantors in the Rio Protocol. Uh, in this capacity, she worked with a team that set the foundation for peace between Ecuador and Peru. No small feat. Uh, she received a superior honor award stating that she, quote, creatively and dynamically coordinated interagency policy and multinational cooperation on both military observation and diplomatic initiatives to bring about negotiations and end the centuries-old conflict between Ecuador and Peru. She holds a JD from UCLA and a Bachelor of Arts from Viola University. She was born in Tacoma, Washington, holds stock in Sea Alaska Corporation, and lives in Maryland with her wife, Amber. I cannot thank you enough for being here, Lynn. I'll turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Trina. I appreciate it. Um, just do a test to make sure everybody can hear me. Great, good. Um, I tell you, these Zoom calls um, and various other video calls have presented numerous challenges to the department, but um, I think we're finally getting the hang of it. Um, we're all used to sitting in our offices with, with um, uh, much less connectivity uh, than we have when we're actually sitting uh, in our homes. So it's, uh, it's been an interesting experience for all of us at State. I thought I would start um, just by talking a little bit about State you know, writ large and then narrow down until we finally get to my office. So the State Department has some 172 embassies, um, a smattering of interest sections. Interest sections um, are what we do in places like Havana, where we don't have an embassy, but we do want to keep track of what's going on in the country. Um, we also have an additional number of consulates. Uh, the consulates uh, are not located in capitals. Uh, the consulates keep track of what's going on locally, and the most important function, uh, to my thinking, for consulates is making sure that American citizens have services uh, and can avail themselves of help from the U.S. government if they need it when they're abroad. So if you're ever abroad and you need some help, um, look for the U.S. consulate in your area or look for the U.S. embassy. So in each of those embassies, and I'll, I'll now begin to narrow down to what I do. Unfortunately, I won't be able to talk that much about energy um, because that's not my area of expertise or that much about circumpolar affairs. Although my office does touch what happens in circumpolar affairs and with energy in, in a couple of ways, and I'll, I'll get to that. So in each of the embassies, there is a human rights officer uh, who deals with human rights issues. Um, this is the individual who's responsible for writing the human rights reports. Um, my bureau is responsible for the 190 uh, human rights reports that are written every year uh, that discuss the situation of human rights in various countries. Okay, now I'm unmuted by the host. Hey, host, stop doing that. Sorry. <laughs> um, right, the human rights reports. I, I mentioned the human rights reports because this is one of the, the products that my bureau creates uh, that is uh, seen most widely of any document that is done in the Department of State. It usually has over a million views by the, by the end of a year. We're told by human rights experts in the UN that they call on it as a document that really helps inform their thinking. Um, so we do the human rights reports, and that's actually not what my office does. My office deals with multilateral affairs, specifically the, how we interact in the United Nations on human rights issues. We do business and human rights issues. We do internet freedom and technology. Uh, we do... Uh, human rights analysis uh, with respect to visa issuance. So if there's a, a person uh, who has committed a gross human rights violation, the law requires us to find, render them ineligible for a visa. So my office you know, takes care of that analysis. Um, we do global policy on democracy promotion, global policy on civil society. What does that mean? Right, so in a lot of other countries, there are groups like yours that, that meet. Um, some of them meet specifically uh, to try to forward human rights issues or to forward health issues. In some countries, um, those kinds of meetings are, are not uh, looked upon very favorably and governments will try to interfere with the ability of people to meet. So my office tries to look at what the global trends are with respect to civil society and tries to help maintain space for groups to meet and talk about issues of the day. Um, why is that important? It's important for a democracy to actually have that capability. Why do we care about that? Well, the view of the United States is that those countries that protect the rights of their citizens, respect the rights of their citizens are more economically viable, they're usually more stable, it makes for a better world, better trading partners for the US, fewer problems. So 
human rights in that respect is a significant part of our national security strategy. Um, and you can actually see it mentioned in the national security strategy. If you go to the White House website and you look up the national security strategy, you'll see a section on American values uh, abroad, and that is where uh, my bureau comes in. My office uh, also handles marginalized populations. We specifically focus on disabled persons and uh, LGBTI individuals. So business and human rights. Actually, uh, I will touch on that because uh, it brings in the energy example. So one of the early things that we did on business and human rights um, has to do with the extractive sector. So uh, oil companies, mining companies, gas companies, um, they were experiencing some difficulty in protecting their fields. Um, and particularly in Colombia, uh, this was happening where British Petroleum would get a report that their uh, pipeline had been um, damaged yet again by uh, the FARC, which was the revolutionary group in Colombia uh, that uh, had you know, quite violent reactions to things and was in conflict with the government of Colombia. And you know that kept happening. And finally, um, they BP started talking to individuals and villages. And the individuals and villages said to them, "Look, you hire these paramilitary guys, and they pressure us. Um, you know, they they hurt us. You know, and then the FARC will hurt us. So we just don't want to have anything to do with any of you." And BP uh, then went to Exxon and other companies and said, "You know, do." You, do you, are you guys having similar problems? They said, yes. They came to the British government. They came to us. They said, hey, what, what can we do about this? And we looked at it you know, all together uh, in what we call a multi-stakeholder group and said, well, one thing you might do is not hire paramilitary thugs. Wow, that was revolutionary for the companies. So the companies started vetting security forces. And what they found in Colombia was once they had security forces that were treating people better, that people started coming to them when they saw their pipeline being moved on. So that morphed into something called the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. Um, it has now um, about 30 member countries um, a variety of uh, oil and gas companies uh, and also some civil society uh, activists who, who take part in this multi-stakeholder initiative to try to make sure that um, companies are taking a look at what are they doing in the human rights frame. So in the business and human rights group, one of the things that we work with uh, in addition to this sort of multi-stakeholder uh, um, initiative is the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Now, the UN GPs basically say governments have the duty to protect human rights, businesses have the duty to respect human rights. So businesses should take a look at what they are doing in the human rights frame. Now, this may sound to you like it's you know kind of hippie stuff, um, but I can tell you, and just yesterday I was at Coca-Cola's Business and Human Rights Conference, well at, I was virtually at it, the, Last year I was at it in Atlanta, but everybody's virtual this year. Um, and there you will see a, a large array of businesses in various sectors that will tell you that shareholder driven uh, business and human rights is something that they are all doing now. They have also noted that it's better for business and better for their bottom line if they can find a way to respect human rights. Now that can get dicey in some countries uh, where uh, human rights are not respected and businesses have certain um, responsibilities to uh, adhere to the law in those countries and that becomes a very interesting and involved conversation. Another area where we've been dealing with business and human rights is in the, the realm of sport, where we take part in the Center for Sport and Human Rights which currently is looking uh, most intensely at the Beijing Olympics and what can we do around the Beijing Olympics uh, to try to pressure China uh, to behave uh, a little bit better in the human rights frame. Now the center has actually had some um, 
some pretty good results in um, uh, Cutter around the um, uh, uh, World Cup. So in Qatar, there were labor arrangements um, that were extremely difficult um, that the Center for Spartan Human Rights working with FIFA has been able to, um, to make a break into. So people are getting better wages and being treated better. Um, and that is the kind of work that we do in the Center for Sport and Human Rights. At the UN, we try to um, basically give US policy uh, a little bit more of a multilateral uh, look to it by working with countries on human rights issues where sometimes just the disinfected of sunlight is the most important thing. So last week, uh, we joined a joint statement on what's going on in Xinjiang in China. I don't know if many of you have uh, followed that or seen in the papers. Uh, in Xinjiang, there are massive um, re-education camps is, is what we say officially. Uh, most of us who work in the human rights field would tell you those are concentration camps where they've got a million Uyghur Muslims who they are trying to uh, change and make them more like the Han Chinese. The circumstance there is quite dire. People are tortured. Um, people uh, are put into forced labor. People are separated from their families. Um, it is it, it probably the worst human rights situation on the globe right now. Um, so we, uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, and others joined together to actually say, this is what's happening in China and it's terrible and countries, you know, you all need to pay attention. Now, when you do that with a country like China, of course, you're not gonna have everyone come with you because China is a powerful country, has a lot of allies, uh, has a lot of economic sway. So it becomes a very long conversation um, that, that we expect to go on for years, frankly. Um, it is hard to change uh, people's behavior. And I will tell you, when I first started in the Bureau 20 years ago, when I went to what was then the Commission on Human Rights in Geneva, I was very skeptical about, you know, what does all this human rights stuff, you know, do? It just, it's all talk. Until I started having people tap me on the shoulder and say to me, my cousin is in jail in Cuba. My aunt is in jail in China. My father is in jail in Pakistan. The stuff that you're doing, they hear about it, matters to them. It helps them to keep going. Um, thank you, United States, for, for speaking up. So and it, it's surprising how much using your voice can really make a difference uh, in the human rights sphere because it's all about influence. It's all about um, staying at it with, with whatever tools you know, we have. And the UN and talking is one of those tools. So that's the business and human rights and the multilateral side. My internet freedom and technology team um, just came out last week uh, with something that we call, and this actually touches on the business and human rights element as well, uh, which is uh, due diligence uh, guidelines for surveillance uh, products. So companies produce surveillance products, right? Like uh, facial recognition, biometrics, uh, gate recognition, you know, an array of things uh, that help uh, security companies or, you know, maybe help you, you know, when you want to unlock your, your iPhone just by looking at it. Uh, that's facial recognition technology. A lot of this technology uh, has a dual purpose and it can be misused in ways um, that are uh, quite um, troubling. So much of this technology does not actually have um, an export regime that goes with it. So we issued uh, this human rights due diligence document so that um, companies might have an idea of what to look for when they're exporting if they also want to be respectful of human rights. Um, that you can find actually uh, on the State Department's webpage. Um, see my visa team. My visa team works with the various regional bureaus that we have. Uh, so we have you know, five regional bureaus uh, that deal with countries like India, 
Um, that's our South Central Asia Bureau. Uh, we've got the East Asian Pacific Bureau that does exactly what that sounds like. The Western Hemisphere Affairs Bureau, the European Affairs Bureau, and the African Affairs Bureau. Each of those um, uh, groups have embassies and the embassies and the consulates visas are issued so that hopefully people can come and tour in the United States or conduct business in the United States. Um, that is why we do visas. Now, sometimes we get people who want visas who uh, have you know, some pretty disturbing uh, human rights records and Congress um, decided that those are the kinds of individual, individuals who shouldn't be let into the United States. Uh, so my visa team you know, spends a lot of time researching um, individuals uh, just to, to try to make sure that uh, if there is a person who has gross human rights violations, they are not admitted. Now, we don't catch everyone. We're human. We're sorry about that. There's also my marginalized populations uh, group. We, they deal with disability issues uh, and with LGBTI issues. What we found on disability issues is that um, it's a great wedge issue, particularly in countries where human rights are not well respected. So if you can go into a country and you can say, hey, you really don't want to treat disabled people like they're um, uh, some stigmatized, horrible group no one should deal with. Most folks will say, oh, you're right about that. You know, we do, we, we do want to treat them better. So you can begin to work at least on the margins of human rights issues with a country like, say, Vietnam, when you talk about disabled individuals. LGBTI is a little bit different. When you go into a country and you say, hey, you know, we really think you should stop killing gay people, um, oftentimes they'll say, yes, that's right. Um, sometimes they'll say, no, <laughs> we disagree. And then you have a, a very interesting and long conversation about the dignity of human beings and why uh, it's in the country's interest to treat every human being with dignity and to respect their basic human rights. They we're not talking about you know, controversial topics um, like cakes or marriage or anything like that. We're just saying, don't kill people. Um, so that is a very thumbnail uh, presentation of what my office does. Hopefully I nested it well enough in what the State Department does that it gave you some basic understanding. Um, and I don't know about you, but I have always hated just looking at a talking head. So I would love to hear your questions. Yeah, certainly. So um, is, is Diane Hyde still on the call? Let's see. She had asked, uh, how well is the United States accepted in the UN? Do we have influence to change human rights behavior in other countries? Um, so we're a, a member of the UN, um, which means we are accepted in the UN. We do, we do have quite a significant voice in the UN um, because of our economic strength, because of our military strength, um, and because we do still pay quite a large part of the budget of the UN. Um, what's hard about the UN is that every country, you know, has a vote. So it's one country, one vote. So you have to, to marshal allies uh, to help you in the UN setting. You can't just say the United States wants X and it happens. You have, you have to work for it. You have to build a coalition. You have to work for it. Um, on influence abroad, yes, we still have quite a lot of influence abroad in no small part because of our hard power and that's our military power. Oh, sorry, thanks. Let's Now, th th this is jargon that I'm not absolutely intimately familiar with. To what extent is stakeholders initiatives being hampered by issues such as trust and social values? Hmm. And that, that's an interesting question, which I, I think I understand. If I don't answer it on point, if the person who asked the question um, could elaborate a little more, that would probably help me. So multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, by their very nature, take in government, they take in um, industry, they take in 
civil society. So let's take an organization like the Freedom Online Coalition, for example. So the Freedom on Co Online Coalition has over 30 governments that participate. Um, and the goal of this organization, uh, of course, is to keep the internet open and free and usable, uh, basically, for everyone. So it fights things like censorship on the net. Uh, it fights things like um, internet shutdowns, uh, that, that sort of thing. So the coalition includes um, business. So Google takes part. Uh, Ericsson phone takes part. Uh, Microsoft takes part. Um, it, think of a, a big company, and they're probably a part of the, the Freedom Online Coalition. There are a number of also business associations, like the Global Network Initiative, that also takes part in the, the Freedom Online Coalition. There are also um, non-governmental organizations or civil society actors. Uh, so, you know, that would be Human Rights Watch, um, Civicus, which is a very large group in uh, South Africa, Connectus, which is a very large group in Brazil, um, and the various uh, organizations that look after the internet. So Access Now, the Electronic Freedom Frontier, Article 19, which is a Paris-based NGO that deals with freedom of expression. So you have a, a, a broad group of, of actors that work on these issues. So do they trust each other all the time? No. NGOs oftentimes don't trust what business is doing and business, you know, sometimes thinks the NGOs are trying to, you know, be too dictatorial about what they're doing. Uh, do either group trust government all the time? No. But part of the reason you have a coalition is to try to have the honest conversations so that we can get to a result that works for, for all, of, all of that group. Does that answer the question? I think I have about four new questions after that. <laughs> no, I, I, I appreciate that very much. So uh, one of our other questions from Mr. Roger, uh, how many countries are currently on the, the do not travel list and which are the largest? Yeah. I don't know the answer to that, um, but I can find that and I will send it to, uh, to Taylor or to you, Eric, uh, after this. No, thank you. So um, last night in the debate, they touched on the US Mexico Canada agreement and looking at the, the State Department's website that strengthens the protection of labor rights. Mm -hmm. uh, with, without really getting uh, too political, would you just kind of describe you know, how your organization worked to iron out that agreement? Right. So the it, USTR is the, is the, the main uh, negotiator usually on trade agreements. Uh, so they, so that's the U.S. Trade uh, Representative, okay. uh, and they do the the large bulk of the negotiation, but they will farm out certain parts to um, experts, right? So in DRL, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, we have an international labor office. They, along with the International Labor Office in the Department of Labor, help to inform some of the provisions that you see in um, the USMCA. Is that? No, no, certainly. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that where you are uh, a, a player of an enormous kind of cog in the wheel, I appreciate it. So um, an, another, another question, um, how liberal is the US policy on the issuance of visas as it relates to marginalized societies? Can I ask what you mean by liberal in this context? I will have to ask uh, Pamela Lowe to uh, unmute herself and describe okay. uh, what she implies by liberal. I mean, so how um, considerate, how much consideration do you show towards these persons? So, so there are a lot of different kinds of visas, right? So if you're getting a visitor visa to come to the United States, um, there is only one requirement, uh, and that requirement is that you show proof that you're going to go home. Um, so that's called a B1, B2 visa. 
Um, there are business visas, and, the, and there the requirement is going to be, you know, show us that you actually are doing business. So if you're a disabled person and, you know, you've got some, some new thing you want to sell in the U.S. and you prove there's some new thing you want to sell in the U.S., it really doesn't matter that you're disabled. Um, if you're talking about asylum issues, uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother bowl of wax. Um, and, and those laws are, are, the implementation of those laws are a little bit in flux right now. Um, so you, you, the administration is, has, you know, year after year now uh, lessened the number of asylees the U.S. will accept. And there are also a number of criteria you have to meet to be an asylee. Um, chief among them is you must show that you have been persecuted against. Um, usually this is political persecution that we're looking at. Um, the last time I recall seeing, uh, it was an LGBTI case uh, in Chechnya. So in Chechnya, which is a part of Russia, there has been a policy to kill the gays, an explicit policy. There, what we tried to do was work with um, third countries uh, to accept Chechens uh, to come into their countries because they're closer, really, than trying to get to the United States. Um, there is also a policy that if a person who's filing for asylum is already located in a safe third, third country, uh, we don't look at those cases. That, that's been a policy of the U.S. for a long, long time. Does that answer your question, Pamela? We'll take that as a resounding yes. Okay. So th 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 thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn, I'm just going to start turning the mic over. As broad as your expertise is, I think giving uh, some of our literate members the opportunity to ask questions themselves and help with that initial rebuttal. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, past president, Mr. Trent Cowles, who had a question on uh, human rights in Mexico. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for being here. This is very interesting. I read an article in the San Diego Tribune this week that over 73,000 people are missing in Mexico. And in Baja, California, parents are searching for missing children and they found over 100, 100 bodies this year of people that just disappear off of street corners. And so how, how is that happening in a, in a neighboring country? And is that something that's getting worse or getting better? Or could you just speak to that general uh, problem. And I also have a second question, <laughs> if we have time. Yeah. So the biggest problem in Mexico um, is not that the government is disappearing people. It's that they don't have any control over the narco traffickers. Um, so there is a tremendous issue with drug traffickers in Mexico. They are brutal. They are relentless. They kill judges. They kill uh, federal police officials. Um, the, in, it, in some of those areas, you know, you, you would probably say that it's lawless. Now, we, we have been trying to help Mexico get a handle on that, but it's a fairly intractable, intractable problem. Um, it would probably take uh, billions of dollars uh, for, for us to help them get a, a full handle on that. But it is, it's a huge problem. It, it's, not, it's not primarily what we would call a human rights problem um, in some ways because the, so, and this, this is an international law thing. So human rights issues <clears throat> are the responsibility of the government and it's when the government is violating, violating uh, a right that we call it a human rights problem. Uh, otherwise we would call it a human rights abuse if it's a third country actor, like a terrorist or, or drug traffickers or, or that sort of thing, if that, if that makes sense. It's very short yeah. sliver of international human rights law. Yeah, that makes sense. I have another question I think that would relate to human rights. I remember with uh, the Green Revolution in Iran and then <clears throat> with what's going on in Venezuela, there there have been uh, revolutions that have risen up through social media. And then I've read that the government has the ability to track social media and basically eliminate and tamp down the revolution. So just speak to the, the pros and cons of social media and technolo technology, technological surveillance. And are we getting to the point where it's 
it's so surprising that the government in Venezuela is still in power. And how are they still in power at this point? And is it, the through the, is it through suppression of, uh, through te technology surveillance, or is it just pure brute force, or just speak more to that on technology's ability to basically make it impossible to overthrow a government at this point? So in Venezuela with Maduro, it's pure brute force. They have the military, uh, they have the police. It's pure brute force. Um, the, the folks who organize, and so there are a number of different ways to organize. Um, and my, my bureau does work in this area to, to, to some degree um, to circumvent uh, some of the, the monitoring. Um, so there are VPN networks that can be used and, the, and there are, you know, there's always new technology coming up to try to uh, defeat monitoring devices. And it's a little bit of a, of a um, it's a cat and mouse game. Um, but, but in a place like Venezuela, it's, it's sheer brute force. So the social media stuff is just another element they can use, but it's brute force. I appreciate that very much. Um, so is, is, is there anything, uh, Mrs. Lynn, that you would like to d d just talk about for, uh, for a couple of minutes that you feel is either underexposed, we don't know enough about? Um, I mean, I, again, like dealing with countries across, across the world, these stages of human rights where now we've got elementary school students learning about basic human rights and then where we started the call today, we have Jeff talking about uh, the, the, the right to a private bathroom, right? So over your almost uh, 30 years in the, the State Department, if you wouldn't mind just kind of touching on some of the, the broad brush developments that you're most proud of, of seeing as, as a human being in uh, DC. Um. I, I probably want to start with in Latin America. Um, you know, as difficult as the situation is in Mexico right now, it's better than it was when I started uh, in the 1990s. Um, they actually do have fr free and fair elections now. Um, that's a step in the right direction. They're trying to deal with their issues, um, but I mean, their issues are massive. Um, we have seen, you know, fairly, uh, fairly good democratic developments in Central America. There are other developments in Central America that are not as good, um, but the, they are open to listening to, you know, how can we do better? Um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, if you take a look at developments in Chile and Argentina uh, from uh, a democracy point of view, uh, Colombia, from both a human rights and democracy point of view, um, things have, have really gotten much better. Um, and that, that's something the U.S. has, you know, played a role in. Um, from, boy, broad strokes. Well, little things. I mean, just, I, I recently read uh, Phil Knight's book called uh, Shoe Dog. So Phil Knight was the founder of Nike who began importing shoes in the 70s and obviously grew robustly. And in the 80s, there was this massive pushback of Nike's sweatshops abroad, right? And from the CEO's position, you know, dealing with all these infrastructures across the developing world, when they would go in with what they considered a competitive wage, it would disrupt whole ecosystems because the employees on the assembly line were making more than doctors. Yeah. So people weren't going into these professional de degrees because they could make more sewing uh, Nike Air Maxes. So, uh, but no, just little things like that of what it means to us versus what it means to, to other countries. But, uh, but no, I won't, I won't put you on the, on, on the spot <laughs> too much. So Lynn, would you have any uh, kind of closing remarks? There, there is one last thing that I do want to say, and, and I, you know, whenever I go home um, to, to Washington State, I get folks who, who will ask me, you know, about all the money we're spending abroad and, you know, why do we do that? And when I tell them, okay, so all that money, you're talking about 
of the budget of the United States of America. Um, and they're usually really surprised by that. So, you know, as you, as you think about it in your own local context, and, and it sounds like, you know, billions and billions of dollars, you know, going, you know, here and there, um, really take a look at what it is that's being spent and what it is that's being done and what percentage it is of the, the budget. Make a decision, you know, for, for what you want to support in that respect and, and you know, let your representatives know. I mean, I, it, it is surprising to me how many people think that the U.S. spends upwards of 15% or more on foreign affairs, and we don't. No, that's great. So um, I grew up going to DC. I've got family in DC. Uh, any museums you think are underappreciated in the in the Smithsonian area, or just uh, f favorite museums in in DC? Um, I think the most underappreciated uh, museum-like place in DC is probably the Library of Congress. Oh, sure. Yep. Which, yeah, if you if you have never been to the Library of Congress, you should go. It's got amazing stuff there. Uh, and the last time I went there, I saw um, Irving Berlin's original score of White Christmas, which was really cool. Actually, uh, I used to follow them on Instagram. I it was wasting too much time at work keeping up with them. But, but no, so uh, in, in honor of your time today, we are going to email you a certificate of appreciation and a donation will be made in your name to Project 44, an Indianapolis-based nonprofit created to raise awareness of the National Bone Marrow Registry, the need for donors, and the impact of a donation of bone marrow can have on a child or adult battling illness. So thanks again, Lynn. And with our last couple of minutes today, I was going to turn it over to Ms. Trina. When we held club meetings in person, we would ask our guests to uh, stand up and introduce themselves. So I'm going to have Ms. Trina kind of work through some of our listeners today. So if you're a guest, uh, please be ready to unmute. And uh, again, thanks for your time. I, thank you. I, do you want me to go now or? No, please, please hang out. Hang okay. out at one, one o'clock. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. I will say one thing, uh, Lynn, before you do get off, there were some uh, chats going around and my favorite one was, holy cow, what a speaker. So thank you uh, <laughs> for taking your time and for sharing uh, just a piece of your wealth of knowledge. Uh, I'm kind of eyeballing down the list. Catch me if uh, I don't call on you and you want to introduce yourself or feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, share any contact information, your LinkedIn, anything like that, um, so others can find you. Let's see, um, Erica Houghton, your name does not look familiar to me. If you'd like to introduce yourself, you are welcome to unmute and do so. Or not. Um, I do see our Kingston, Jamaica friends. There are several familiar names on there. Does anyone want to say hi? Susie Lee, Colin Susie Lee, our president from New Kingston. Perfect. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys being here with us throughout uh, our whole remote in, period. You know, so I am um, very interesting meeting, but. Um, since you do not have time, we will leave it alone and hope next week you get a chance to tell you how Judith and Sonia are part of the year in our recently held award ceremony. <laughs> good morning, everyone. Hey, good morning. Okay. I love seeing the faces from you guys. Very interesting meeting, very interesting meeting. Because we've had some cases here in Jamaica too where we've had children been missing. And um, you know, uh, we're just wondering what's happening. If it's, we're just wondering what's happening. Yeah, eyeball. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I'm no, I'm I'm done. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing Nord's Lecky. It's not a name I recognize. Do you Nordia. Want to say hello? Nordia. Nordia. Thank you. <laughs> Another Jamaican friend. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
Hi, see, everyone. we've got a ah, thank you. We've got a good friend of mine uh, from Los Angeles who I served in a young professional service organization with, uh, Robin Day. You want to say hi? Hi, I'm Robin from Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> Trina was so nice to share this with me. It was very interesting. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. I always like seeing familiar faces and names. Um, I think those are our guests. If there's anybody, great, I great. didn't. Great, no, thank you. Yeah so, yeah, so we'll work to refine that format a little bit <laughs> where we can have some mini biographies ready for everyone to present. So thanks again to Miss Lynn speaking today. Uh, please join us next Thursday, October 15th with Greg Dye, director of the Duke Lemur Center. Have a great rest of your week and everybody's got two and a half minutes to prepare for their next 1 p.m. Zoom meeting. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Congrats, Eric. All right, thank you. Bye-bye, great meeting.